Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jean-Marc Lima, and joining me today from London is Jonas Kano, Director of EMEA and APAC at Airedale International. Um, Jonas, thank you so much for talking to me. We were just saying that we haven't spoken to each other for nearly three years. <laughs> I mean, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, uh, considering the, the crazy things that's been going on due to the pandemic and what have you, but uh, we're surviving. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Uh, but look, the pandemic has brought as much as many challenges as it has brought opportunities as well to this industry. Um, and I think we all agree that the industry has embraced them quite well. Um, what would you say has been a couple of interesting things that you've seen changing over the last 12, 18 months um, in the data center space? I think it's, it's quite interesting because uh, for, I would say, three to five years prior to the pandemic, Everybody's been talking about digital transformation, uh, 5G, all the various things about IOTs and what have you, and the potential. And it seems that the pandemic itself has just forced that potential through. So one of the real changes we're seeing is companies are reevaluating actually what do we do about digital transformation? It's a reality because everybody's forced from working from home and you know working on Zoom, just like we're talking on Zoom now. Um, a lot of companies are thinking. We need to make this a reality. And we're seeing the fruits of that implementation as we speak. Hmm. No, it, it makes sense. And I guess this is not going to go away either um, once, once we are over the pandemic, um, which no, is- No, I think it, it's a catalyst. You know, hmm. you know hmm. aside from the whole health scenario, um, from, an, from a, a, an IT perspective, from a data center perspective, due to transformation, um, I think this is the big catalyst that would, you know, there's almost before pandemic and after post pandemic. Yeah. Uh, um, and so they're not going to go away. I think it would accelerate um, already with the, the big rollout of, of 5G um, and with the, the movement that electric cars are making in the market, which is edging towards that driverless car dream, uh, which Tesla is pushing. You can see that, you know, the, the basic infrastructure for the new world, the new digital reality is being put in place now. Mm. Yeah. Well, and first, it's good to see that all this infrastructure has been recognized now as critical infrastructure um, almost everywhere in the world, um, especially in Europe. We've seen it really being spoken about by governments and we've seen data centers being put down as critical infrastructure, which is really good. Um, yeah. And I mean, we've literally leapfrogged an entire decade in the space of 12 months. Um, but with this as well, I mean, of course, we leapfrogged a decade, more data center power. This all requires also more power and cooling. Um, what have you seen? What have you seen within the cooling space in the data center um, change? Um, I, it's, it's an interesting question uh, because there's been, as you know, there's always been a lot of talk of new cooling technologies, uh, whether it's liquid cooling uh, and what have you. But I think from a, a technology uh, progress perspective, not much has changed. What has changed is the massive increase in deployment. I think what's driving this is, you know, you have hyperscale companies, which obviously are, are moving very quickly. You have technical real estate companies, as you know, mm. and they are businesses that have particular business needs. And you know, the pandemic and all the digital transformation process after that has really driven those uh, business needs, as it were. And so it's coming down to the cooling side of things. I think we're, we're more busy with, you know, looking at innovation around making sure we can keep in step with these particular needs. So, for example, in, in technical real estate, again, it's just real estate, right? Just like office, but obviously it's technical space, data centers, co-location. And uh, there's a massive drive across Europe to really look for these powered uh, facilities. And at the same time, a massive drive to really get the hyperscales to come in as tenants. And so the big innovation now is if they come in at the last minute because they don't want to pay until they've got you know, a signed contract to come in, how quickly can we deploy you know, the various infrastructure, very physical infrastructure, which obviously includes cooling. Hmm. Um, the, the, the OPEX side of things, how can we use various free cooling methodologies to keep that OPEX as low as possible? So that's where the innovation is, you know, the, the business process, the way that we actually deploy these units. 
Not to say there isn't massive innovation when it comes to cooling technology. Of course there is. I think that's still in step with new ways of looking at data center design, like OCP one. And that step is slightly at a different pace to the massive business demands of the co-location hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting because we can then distinguish the speed of deployment that we need right now um, and probably over the next half decade, and then what's gonna change um, in terms of technology and it's gonna really reshape, transform the inside of the data center um, or maybe the outside. <laughs> Well, you know, just on, on that point, I think um, not to say that um, in the near future, there won't be massive change. We know that obviously 5G uh, because of low latency and you know, decentralized computing um, mm. will, will create a massive change just in itself. Not quite there yet, but we know that the infrastructure is there to actually drive 5G. Also think HPC as well, high performance computing, which is now becoming a massive you know, area only because you know, there's more number crunching to do. There's more uh, things that, that AI drive to be able to get that information. Um, and that would obviously create new technologies, new ideas. So it's there. I think the real focus now would be you know, how do you meet the needs, the current business needs for, hmm. for these uh, large um, physical infrastructure facilities. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, and speaking, uh, speaking how to um, provide for those needs that we have today, I mean, Airdale is one of the biggest players in this space um, in the data center world. Tell us about the business. What's Airdale like today? Um, what, how have things changed or how has market demand changed over the last 12 months? I guess we will kind of lined up with what you just said. Um, and what's next? What are you guys planning on to launch, to, to unveil, to, to buy? <laughs> what, what's, what's next? <laughs> right. Um, so Airdale is a, an interesting company. Uh, so Airdale started off as a relatively small player in 1974. So that's when I was two. Um, and it incidentally started off, or interestingly enough, started off in the IT space. Then it was data processing. So it's a cracking, it's air conditioning. Um, and then it got into chiller. Um, the mainstay for Airdale up until probably about four years ago uh, was commercial chillers, either in the commercial HVAC market, like you know, mm. schools and hospitals and, and, um, and commercial buildings, just in normal chillers, as it were, um, or within the, um, how do I put it, the enterprise data center space, you know, where a company has their own data center, relatively small. Um, it's only in the last three years or so, three, four years, that it's got involved in the, the big co-location hyperscale. Uh, and I was brought on to accelerate that process. Hmm. But incidentally enough, Airdale in 2005 was brought out by a company called Modin. Um, and Modin classed themselves as the largest thermal management company, but mainly in vehicles. So, you know, you're cooling within tractors and, and vehicles and also cars and what have you, with companies, uh, clients like Ford, um, and they realized only recently that electric cars is probably not the way to go when it comes to cooling for their business. So they've sold off their vehicular departments um, okay. and are now heavily looking at the building HVAC space, particular data center. So you've got this position between molding saying, mm, let's start investing our real might because they're a $2 billion company on the hmm. New York. Um, with one of their acquisitions, um, which they've left alone until now, um, with this massive growth in data center. So um, Edo has undergrown massive change. Now, Modi had 42 factories around the world uh, that make made different things. And suddenly, rather than Edo having one huge facility leads, which is what we've done to export globally, um, now we're trying to become a very different player utilizing a lot of these factories around the world, having Airdale America, and then obviously ultimately in APAC region and being a true global player. Because the funny thing is when you're dealing with co-location hyperscale companies, you're dealing with global companies, you're dealing with companies that want a global standard, um, that don't necessarily look at the products as engineered solutions, but look at them as you know, products that need to be put in, in the right place at the right time. So it becomes about logistics comes about service management. And so therefore they need a player that can deal with them globally. And so we are turning into a, if 
a very good niche player, um, European mm. niche player, into a global phenomenon. Mm. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay. Um, but just picking up what you said, so of course you're becoming a niche player um, in that sense, but because of the past with uh, the automotive industry, for example, you do have expertise on how to deal with verticals. Um, is this something that we're going to see Erdel working more with? So automotive companies, we've seen Volvo, for example, announcing they're going to build a large data center, um, yeah. I believe in Sweden, um, Sweden or Norway, I think it's Sweden, um, in the coming years. Um, Range Rover did the same last year. Um, I'm going to see you guys working more with automotive companies as well to build their own data center facilities and even other verticals, so healthcare, schools, government, etc. Yeah, of course, that's one of the things we're looking at. I mean, yeah. we, so it's interesting because you mentioned two verticals that are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hand in hand. So one hand, we're in a data center vertical. On the other hand, you have the uh, mm -hmm. vehicle transfer, transport vertical. Mm -hmm. um, so Edo will still provide commercial HVACs to various verticals, but also you would have the data center, um, uh, how do I put it, data center solutions division, as it were, um, that would be provided into hyperscale and co-location. Now, we would always have data center products, so therefore verticals can still sell our products within you know, their particular vertical. So it's interesting because we've just gone through a transition where rather than look at, um, our sales organization from, an, from a geographical perspective would now turn it into verticals. We've got that transition anyway. Um, so the case is, how do we create strategies for these various verticals? Because they're slightly different. Slightly different products required, slightly different demands. And the biggest vertical at the moment, at least, will always be your hyperscale and co-location. But yes, we, we will still be involved in the marketplace as a whole. Wherever there's a requirement for industrial-based cooling and thermal management, we'll be there. Hmm. Okay. How would you describe Airdale's journey for the next 12, 24 months in one word? Um, AI. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, I say that because, you know, we will continue to build innovative products. We will hmm. continue to build new markets. We'll continue to be commercially astute uh, because the market's changing, it's going through an explosion, and the various uh, um, things that one has to do to be able to navigate these changes, and that's a given. Um, what we feel uh, will differentiate us is we're seeing ourselves less of a product company, as you manufacture stuff, less involved in just thinking about how do you manufacture a product and how do you get it shipped and more of a, a solution provider, a, a particular service. And when you think about it, if you're, the, the, the service is cooling, right? And yet cooling is very interesting because you would think, well, let's just keep the cooling as low as possible. Let's keep the temperature as low as possible. But in reality, you know, the temperature needs to be just right relative to ASHRAE figures because now you can cool higher, hotter. Um, you've got more, HPC environments coming in, you've got mixed environments within a particular one space. How would you deal with these various uh, cooling needs? Um, and also to do with maintenance, because you know, that impacts the, the resilience of the facility. And we find that AI is a solution. You know, whether it's a case of getting these cooling facilities to talk to each other, to react, to learn the pulse of that particular data set. Every day center is different. How do you learn using, you know, trend information uh, and analyze that and train, you know, the cooling, you know, units to actually cool in a more efficient way? Um, but also, how do you create a scenario where um, you you know to maintain the unit before it actually needs maintaining? You know, predictive maintenance. What are the things that would make us unique in that scenario? Because the problem isn't about cooling anymore. I mean, that's just mechanical. Um, yeah, yeah, it's standard. I mean, you know, we'd just be another mechanical cooling manufacturer. Um, and we'd always be, we'd always strive to be the best at that, of course. But the issue is now, if you've got a unit in there that would last for, let's say, 10 years, the, the life cycle of a data center is 20, 30 years now, you know, how would that machine do what it's meant to do over that lifetime? Uh, because 
co-location hyperscale, the physical infrastructure is about, is a cost base. So it becomes a financial analysis for the owners of this facility. Hmm. So how into that? Um, and that's where we feel will we'll, we'll be different moving forward over the next 12 months. Okay. I mean, that's very interesting because as you say that, you took me back to 2015 when I went to, I mean, literally when I went to Stuttgart um, to a conference there. And this is what Bosch was saying that they're going to be doing around the end of the decade. So around last year, um, I haven't really followed up to know if they did or not, but they were talking about all this as well. So creating the digital twins, creating this health healing infrastructure, creating the AI enabled infrastructure that can run itself, um, not just on a cooling and power perspective, but with other things that come with a factory, which are different to a data center. Um, so I, I think that's, that's very, very interesting. I'm sure there's a lot more that we can talk <laughs> um, on that level, because it seems like a big shift as well um, within Airedale as well. Um, it is. It is a big shift yeah. when you're going global. Yeah. Um, and Jonas, if people want to find more information about Airedale and the work you're doing, and then, of course, this AI future that's coming over the next year, um, where can people go to find out more? Um, so our website has always been there. Um, so it will be www.airedale.com, very straightforward. Hmm. Um, that gives you a view of what we're doing, certainly in Europe. Um, to get a bigger view of you know, how we are working with our parent company, Modine, um, then it will be www.modine, M-O-D-I-N-E.com. Hmm. I think those two websites will give you an overview of where we are. Okay, well, that sounds good, Jonas. Thank you so much for your time. It's been nice to catch up <laughs> after three years. Always I didn't realize it was three years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thank you, our viewers, for tuning into JSA TV and JSA podcasts. And don't forget to check our social channels for more content. Until next time, happy networking.